Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. What, is exactly, what exactly does it mean to be the salt of the earth? And what does it mean to be the light of the world? Well, those are two of the questions we want to address because we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20 today. But those two questions about those two metaphors of salt and light then lead into where Jesus says that he did not come to abolish or to nullify or to set aside the law and the prophets. So what's the implication of that? Well, that's an important question, and we're going to spend a few minutes talking about that. So we're going to jump in with verse 13, and first of all, discuss what it means for us to be the salt of the earth. We'll transition to the light of the world, and then we'll get to this material about the law and the prophets. So verse 13, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. We, we in Texas would say y'all because this is a second person plural. So you all are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, the Greek has a strange verb there. It is morino, which literally means to become foolish. And here it's used in the sense of losing its flavor or losing its taste. So if salt should lose its taste or flavor, then how shall its saltiness be restored? It's not good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So what, what aspect of salt is Jesus focusing in on here? Because as a metaphor, salt could stand for any number of things. Well, I think it would be a mistake to kind of narrow it down to one thing and say, well, Jesus is talking about how his disciples, his followers are going to be the the way of preserving the earth or flavoring the earth or something like that because salt was used in a variety of different ways, and it's the characteristics of metaphors to kind of like poetry to allow for a multiplicity of applications. So, for instance, we know that in the ancient world, as in today's world as well, salt was used for, for flavoring, for preserving, for cleansing. It was added to the sacrifices, as we have it described in the book of Leviticus. It was used for practical purposes, such as brightening lamps and enhancing the ovens that were used in Israel. And depending upon the quantity, it could either be used to fertilize the soil or to make the soil unfruitful. Paul uses the image of seasoning in Colossians 4, 6, where he says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So with all these variety of usages of salt, which one does Jesus have in mind? Well, again, I expect that he has more than one of these in mind because that is the nature of the metaphor itself. So you're to be the salt of the earth, whether that's in flavoring or in preserving or kind of the sacrificial quality is implicated here. All of these together is what it means for us to be the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its flavor, well, then it's not good for anything. I mean, you just as well throw it away, right? Now, the question that perennially comes up when, when, this, when this verse arises is, well, how can salt become unsalt? That, that's, that's a chemical impossibility. Well, there's a couple of different ways that we can explain this. R.T. France, for instance, says that, yes, strictly speaking, sodium chloride is a stable compound. It can't lose its quality. But the salt used in Palestine, derived either from the deposits around the Dead Sea or from salt pans in which its water was evaporated, wasn't pure sodium chloride. It wasn't pure salt. And so the salt could leach out, leaving other minerals like, like gypsum. So maybe that's what he had in mind. I think what's going on is, is that the how doesn't really matter. How salt could become unsalty is beside the point. The point is that unsalty salt is useless. It's as useless as dry water or hot ice or a dark sun. That is, it's antithetical to its very nature. It's being untrue to its very nature. His point is that if we, as the disciples of Jesus, become unsalt, well, then we are being untrue to the very way in which God our Father has made us to be. So we are to be true to that nature, true to who God has made us to be in Christ. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth. And if we're not, well, then we've lost the very nature which has been given to us by God in Christ. So we're the salt of the earth, and that salt is used by God for all these different sorts of ways. So that's the first image, the salt. Now, what do we have coming next? This is verse 14 through 16. You, again, this is y'all, so you all, second person plural, you all are the light of the world. I think, by the way, the, 
the, the second person plural is important. This is not an individualistic sermon. He's talking to a community of believers. We would say the church today. He's talking to everyone who is part of the band of disciples around Jesus. So you all are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, of course, a city set on a hill is designed by its very purpose not to be hidden. The, very con- the way in which it is constructed, the place it is constructed, is intended, of course, to be seen. And that's what Jesus is getting at here with the image of light. And the city that's built or set on a hill cannot be hidden. He wants his disciples, he wants us, he wants the community of the faithful to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And this light, of course, is going to provide illumination. Again, just like salt... Light has a number of different ways in which it's used throughout the scriptures, but over and over it's used in this good, positive sort of way in which it dispels the darkness. It provides clarity. It illuminates the way before us, all these various ways. Now, Jesus says that if you have a light, what do you do with it? Well, you're not going to, you're not going to hide it. You're going to let it give light to everyone, every place in the room. Now, a couple things here that are, that are helpful from the Greek. First of all, this lamp is luknos. The Latin for light, by the way, is lux. We get our words like lucid and lucifer from that Latin origin. Now, the lamp that is being talked about here is it's a small container with a wick that extends from it, typically burn oil in order to give light to, to a room. And because most first century Jewish houses were un, they didn't have interior walls, just one big space. Well, then, of course, one light would provide light illumination for the, for the entire room. And when he talks about it being covered up by a bushel basket, that's actually a Latin word, modios. It's borrowed from Latin, taken into Greek. And it just simply refers to a, a standard measure for, for grain. So it's some kind of container, holds about eight U.S. dry quarts, and it was probably found in most, most households, just an ordinary container that most families would have had. So you don't put it, you don't put that light, you put that basket over the light, of course, that destroys the very purpose. Again, it's like the salt. Light is created for illumination. You don't hide the light, just like a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Instead, it is there to provide the illumination that is by its very nature how it was designed to be. Again, it's getting back to who we are created to be as the disciples of Jesus, salt and light. This is the way in which God our Father has formed us in Christ to be so that we provide that that flavoring or that preservation or that sacrificial character of a life that salt provides, but also that we provide this illumination. That is to say, we are the ones through whom God works to bring the light of his word and the light of hope to, to the world. Now, the metaphor of light is used in all sorts of different ways. As we see from this quote from John Nolan's Matthew commentary, it's found in the Jewish sources, the light of the world is applied to to God, to Adam, to distinguish rabbis, to Israel, to the Torah, to the temple, to Jerusalem. Now, Cicero, interestingly, considered Rome to be a light to the whole world. And then in John 8, Jesus is the light of the world. In Isaiah 42, 6 and 49 and chapter 60, you had this servant that is a light to the nations, the servant being either Israel or personified Israel in the, in the Messiah. So you have all of these different sorts of ways in which light is being used metaphorically in the Old Testament as well as in Jewish literature. But the point is that you have God creating us in Jesus Christ as his disciples to be those who provide this light so that others may see our good works, glorify our Father, who is in heaven. We are walking lights, as it were, because we're filled with the Spirit himself who brings the light of Christ into us and then shines that light through us to those who are around us. Now, let's move on to the next section, which is Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, as we usually say, or yoda, not an iota or yoda, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. 
Okay, so there's a number of questions we need to ask here. We need to ask, what does he mean by the law? What does he mean by the law and the prophets? What's this language of abolish or destroy? And what, is, what does it mean to fulfill? There's a, there's a number of questions that arise from this passage. And I think it's one that's pretty easily understood and misapplied in a lot of different circumstances. So let's spend a few minutes unpacking this so we can better understand what Jesus is teaching us here. First of all, let's identify exactly what is meant by the law and the prophets. So, as you probably know, the, the, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, was divided in different sorts of ways. Today, it has a threefold division. That was just emerging in the first century, but by and large, it had just a twofold division in the first century, and that was the law and the prophets. So, when Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, basically, that's shorthand for I didn't come to abolish the, whole, the Old Testament, the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. That's what he's talking about here. So he didn't come to abolish the Bible as it was understood by first century Jews, the, the Old Testament. And then he also says, so it begins by talking about the law or the prophets, and then he transitions to say that the law, so not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law. But keep in mind, too, that the law can mean the whole Old Testament. Ordinarily, the law was the Torah, which is, or the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. However, here I would argue that when he, when he mentions the law, he's simply using law as a shorthand for the entire Tanakh, the entire Old Testament. And this is, this is found in other places in the New Testament as well, where law represents the entire Old Testament and not just the first five books. So for instance, John 10, Jesus says, is it not written in your law, quote, I said you are God's. Well, that's a quote from the book of Psalms. So Jesus is quoting from the Psalms, but he's saying it's in the law because the law here is used in this very general, broad sort of way for the entire Hebrew Bible. Same thing in John 15. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. Quote, they hated me without a cause. That is another quote from the Psalms. So once more, the book of Psalms is said to be in the law because the law here represents the entire Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 14, 21, Paul says the same thing. In the law, it is written by people of strange tongues. Well, he's quoting from Isaiah there, and yet he says it's in the law. So quotes from the Psalms and Isaiah are said in these instances to be in the law. And I would argue that's what's going on here. So when Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament. He, he, I didn't come to abolish the, our scriptures. I didn't come to set those aside. And then the second time that he mentions the law, I would argue he's not talking about the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books. He's talking about the entire Old Testament. So in both the law and the prophets, as well as in the law, he's using this in a very broad way to say, I didn't come to set aside the scriptures. I didn't come to nullify the scriptures. I think one of the mistakes that people make is by isolating in and saying, see, Jesus didn't come to abolish the, the law and understanding that only in the sense of, for instance, the Jewish ceremonial law. We're understanding it only in sense of the Ten Commandments. They're only understanding it in a, in a legal sort of way. No, the law of the prophets and the law there are a reference to the entire Old Testament, to the Hebrew Bible. Jesus did not come to nullify or abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, what exactly does that mean? The verb that's translated as abolish here is katoluo. It can also be translated in any number of ways, as you can see on your screen. So thrown, abolish, destroy. It's the idea or overthrow. It's used in a number of instances, for instance, in, 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 uh, in Josephus to talk about the setting aside or the abolishing of customs. So Jesus says he didn't come to abolish, to nullify, or to set aside the scriptures. That's, that was not his purpose. The scriptures will stand. The Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, call it what you wish, the law, the prophets, all of that, Jesus didn't come to do away with, by no means. Instead, he came to do what with it? He came to fulfill it. Pleirao is the Greek that's used there. Now, this is very important. How do we understand, just th think for a second, how do we understand what an author means? Well, one of the ways that we understand what he means is by context. So you look at the ways, for instance, where the way that he uses a particular word. You can say, oh, well, he uses this, this particular verb in a number of different ways. So let's look at those instances. Or he uses this noun in a number of ways. So let's look and see how he uses that. Or maybe he uses grammatical construction in a certain sort of way. So let's look at the, the five or ten ways that he uses that. So you get an idea for what an author means by seeing how he uses a word 
such as we have here with fulfill. So how does Matthew use the word fulfill? Well, let's look at these instances. There's a whole bunch of them. First of all, Matthew 1. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. And all of these fulfills are the verb plerao, the same one used in Matthew 5. This was to, Matthew 2, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I call my son. That's a quote from Hosea. Matthew 2, 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew 2, 23, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he be called a Nazarene. Matthew 3, 15, let, this is when Jesus tells John the Baptist to let him be baptized. Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then just to glance at more of these, Matthew 4 is Isaiah being fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 is the one we're looking at now. Matthew 8, 17 is another quote from Isaiah, which is being fulfilled. We have Matthew 12, 13, 21. All of these are in reference to, with a couple of exceptions, which is kind of a different use of the verb, but all of these where you have fulfill are talking about the fulfillment of the prophets or the law, the Old Testament, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Jeremiah, whether it's Zechariah or someone else. So when Jesus says, he didn't, he didn't come to, to nullify or to destroy the law of the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. Well, what is he saying? Well, he's saying that he came as the one to whom all the law and the prophets were pointing. So he fills them to the full because they're all pointing to him, him who is the yes and the amen to all the promises of God. So, of course, he didn't come to nullify or to set aside the law of the prophets because these were messianically designed to be pointing toward him who is their fulfillment. So he's the period at the end of every sentence. He's the exclamation point at the end of every promise. He is the one who fills in the blank to all of these promises of God. That's what he means that he came to fulfill them. And all you have to do is simply look at all of those references in Matthew to where he uses that verb, plerao, to understand what Jesus means. He came to, to fill up the Old Testament with himself because he is the fulfillment of that Old Testament. That's what he means there. Now, he also goes on to say something about the, the Yoda and the dot. Now, what's going on there? He says he didn't come to, to, to abolish, but to fulfill. And then he goes on to say, amen, I say to you, or truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a Yoda, or iota, as we sometimes say it here in America, not a yoda, not a dot. Now, in Greek, a dot is a karaya, which is literally a, a hook or some kind of projection. So, not a jot or a tittle, as the old King James put it. Not a, a yoda or a dot will pass from what? Well, will pass from the law of the prophets, pass from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, you, I have a, just a, on your screen, you can see a, a couple of examples of this. First of all, when he says a Yoda, of course, that is a, it's a Greek letter. It's, a, it's the smallest of the Greek letters. And since he's talking about the law and the prophets, which are written in Hebrew, then presumably he's talking about the equivalent to that in, in, in Hebrew, which would be this small letter Yod, which I have in red there for you. It's the smallest of, of the Hebrew letters. So that would be the equivalent of the Greek Yoda. So not a Yoda or not a Yod will pass from the law. Now, when he mentions the hook or the projection, the karaya, which translated here as dot, and Old King James had his tittle, that is a very small part of letters. So you'll see, for instance, on the, uh, the Hebrew dalet, which is a D, that little projection on the right-hand side, that's one of these instances of what would be a projection or a hook, a karaya. And the same with the, the bait, which is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You can see one of those sticking out. That's just, just a small extension of the line, and that helps then to distinguish it from similar-looking letters. So what Jesus is saying is basically, listen, he's just kind of getting in, into the, the fine points. He says not even, the, not even the smallest part of the law is going to pass away. And again, by law here, he means the law and the prophets. He means the entire Hebrew scriptures. They're all going to stay there. He's not nullifying them. So he, he's kind of exaggerating to make a point. He's saying like, you know, that little bitty tiny projection on some of these letters, even that's not going to go away. In other words, the word of God will stand. I didn't come to do it with, with, with the word of God. I came to teach it for sure. I came to, to provide illumination as to exactly what it means. I came to correct some of your misunderstandings of that word. 
But I didn't come to do away with it. So not even the smallest part of this, not even the smallest letter is going to be done away with. Instead, I came to fulfill this scripture. That is the purpose for which I, I came. So until heaven and earth pass away, these scriptures will remain. And they remain for us as Christians as the, the testament of everything God has done from, the, from, from creation to his choosing of Israel to the Exodus to everything that happened with Joshua and Samuel and the kings all the way to the end of the prophets. All of this remains the scriptures that God has given to us that bear witness to the one who is the fulfillment of those scriptures. All right, we have one section to finish, and this is Matthew 5, 19 through 20. Therefore, whoever relaxes, now the verb used there in Greek is luo. It's related to kataluo. Kataluo is the one that was translated to nullify or to abolish. Jesus did not come to kataluo, the law and the prophets. So there's a connection here between the verb used here and the verb used earlier. So whoever luo relaxes, looses one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is kind of extending his discussion of what he's been talking about earlier. So he he didn't come to kataluo, to abolish the law and the prophets. And so he says to his disciples, including all of us, well, don't you you either? So don't you be... Luo, I, I didn't come to katalu, I didn't come to abolish, so don't you, Luo, don't you to, to soften or loose or ignore one of these commandments. Teach the scriptures. Because if, if you don't, if you, if you Luo, if you, if you soften or if you nullify one of the least of these commandments, well, then you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. So he's, he's giving a strict warning to those who are teachers not to set aside the scriptures. He didn't come to set aside the scriptures, and so neither should those who are his disciples and those who teach others. Now, you might be asking, what's, what's the difference between like a, a small command and a great command? Well, the rabbis, later rabbis, would have used the language of light and heavy commandments. And we don't know for sure what Jesus had in mind, but let me just give you an example of what later rabbis referred to as a, as a light commandment. And that would be Deuteronomy 22, verse 6 where you read that if you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you and that you may live long. So that's just one example of what might have been kind of in the back of Jesus' mind when he's talking about like commandments. So there's some commandments which are weightier more significant, such as the Ten Commandments. And there's other commandments which were were considered important, but not as important as these weightier aspects of the the Torah. Now, he wraps everything up with what might on the surface seem to be uh, really a a startling declaration with regard to righteousness. He says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, for those of you who who know David Goggins, uh, it would be like saying, unless your athleticism, unless your workout routine exceeds that of David Goggins, you will by no means enter the kingdom of the fit and the athletic. So it's, it's kind of the same comparison here because the scribes and the Pharisees were the, the religious David Goggins of the day. That is to say, they were they were extremely committed to the minutia of the law, to the punctilious op- op- observation and keeping of all of these commandments. So when Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of these super religious people, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's been a startling, a startling declaration to hear by these earliest disciples. Now, we have clarity when we begin to realize that what Jesus is teaching here must be a different kind of righteousness. Because you just simply can't out-righteousness the scribes and the Pharisees if you're talking about a righteousness of the law. It it, it simply is unthinkable that you're to be a a better keeper of the law than the scribes and the Pharisees. Because the scribes and the Pharisees were held up to be the religious best, the cream of the crop. So Jesus must be talking here about a very different sort of righteousness. 
And I would argue the righteousness he's talking about is the very righteousness that he, that he discussed with John the Baptist when John didn't want to baptize Jesus. He says, well, I need to be baptized by you, and, and you're coming to be baptized by me? And Jesus says, permit it to be so now, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus comes to fulfill. There's that verb play rao again. He comes to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus is doing the things necessary to make sure that righteousness gets filled to the full. And it's that righteousness and that righteousness of Christ alone that exceeds what the scribes and the Pharisees could ever dream of having because it's the righteousness of the Messiah himself, the righteousness that he came to to acquire and the righteousness that he comes then to give to us. So we don't, we don't need a righteousness that we've worked up. We need a righteousness that we have received from the hand of a good and gracious Father, and that's what we have in Jesus Christ. So the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees is a very different kind. It's not a legal righteousness. It's not a righteousness that's based upon this punctilious commandment keeping. It's a righteousness based upon the saving work of Jesus Christ, and that doesn't just exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. It's on a whole new level because it is the righteousness that makes us right with our Heavenly Father. And it's that righteousness that we need and that righteousness which we receive from the hand of our good and gracious Father through Jesus Christ and the work of His Holy Spirit. So that's a quick run through through Matthew 5, 13 through 20. Salt of the earth, light of the world, Jesus did not come to abolish the Old Testament, but to fulfill it. That's what he teaches in these scriptures. Hope that you're all doing well. We'll pick up more from the Sermon on the Mount in next week's video. So we'll see you then.